do have a quorum here. Um, in your packets, folks, I'm sorry, in your emails, you're going to have a, uh, a proposed agenda for today. Uh, if uh, nobody has any questions or comments on it, uh, I'm seeking a, uh, a motion to accept the, uh, the agenda as proposed. I'll do that, Roger. I'll second. second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Also in your emails, you received the, uh, the minutes of our May 18th meeting. Zoom meeting. Uh, if there is any comments or questions on that, if not, I'll need a motion uh, to accept the uh, the minutes of the May 18th meeting. Motion. Second. I guess that was Mike. Uh, second it. Yes. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Thank you. Thank you for attending today. Here, just a couple updates here. Uh, on Friday, five upstate regions have entered phase three uh, of the, of the uh, COVID uh, um, reentry here. That those uh, areas or those uh, regions that are uh, in, uh, entering phase three are Finger Lakes, Central New York, Mohawk Valley, the North Country, and Southern Tier. If you don't, if you're not aware, phase three industries include uh, tattoo parlors. Yay! <laughs> um, <laughs> nail salons, uh, massage therapy, and limited indoor dining. I noticed on the website, the Department of Health website this morning, that everything has been updated for, if you want to understand you're in, in one of those industries and you want to understand what you can and can't do, um, it's all there. So it looks like it was updated and it's pretty much in layman's terms. So that, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, let's see here. Also, um, if other regions continue to show low infection rates, uh, Western New York could probably, and I use probably, uh, resume phase three on the 16th, which is tomorrow. Uh, the Capital District will be Wednesday, and the Mid-Hudson region will be next week. So really, if, if you really look at it, the New York City is really the only region that's still in phase one. And depending on if the trends continue the way they are, uh, they, they could possibly get to phase two on June 22nd. So that, that, that definitely would be a good thing. Um, I got a heads up on Thursday of last week that uh, Watertown was going to have its first um, antibody testing. Um, the Department of Health is, wants to make sure that they don't let anybody know they're, they're just doing pop-up antibody testing around the regions, around all of the state. Um, they did it at the Price Chopper in Watertown. They were supposed to start at 9 o'clock on, uh, on, uh, on Friday, and I guess they had some problems. The stores, sprinklers went off about 4 o'clock in the morning, so they had to clean the store before they could uh, let number one shoppers in. And... Uh, and uh, do the uh, antibody testing. So I guess they weren't really ready to move until about 11 o'clock in the morning, which was, it was kind of disappointing for them. But really the, the purpose of these pop-up antibody testing, they just did uh, one last week also in Utica and Rome. And really the, uh, what they're, they're really, they don't want to let anybody know. And unfortunately they didn't say, Jan, don't let anybody know. But uh, they want just, uh, you know, uh, uh, just, you know, statistical sample of people that are coming in that are shopping and I guess that Price Chopper is a very very busy store they just want people to come in and they want to be able to say hey would you like a test here's what we got to do and this is an antibody test so you're really looking uh, what happened yesterday and prior to that to find out if you did have uh, the COVID disease and uh, I guess what really the uh, the ultimate goal of this thing is they're trying to create so many databases here with the Department of Health to determine who had it it's a good example by region of who could possibly phase two and phase, or let's put it this one, when it, when, when it heats up again, um, they can make a determination of really how they can combat this disease. So uh, they're going to be doing these pop-up tests all over the region. Uh, and like I said, the first one, unfortunately, there was a little stiff start um, in Watertown. That was on Friday at the Price Chopper. But I guess they, they got quite a few people that did it, so. Uh, also last week, the governor did a couple of executive orders. One was he was going to extend the, uh, the voting for school board elections and school budget votes um, um, 
June 9th was for Dropbox, and then uh, June 16th, it was extended to June 16th, which is tomorrow, for any mail-in votes for uh, for school uh, school uh, board elections. Uh, also, the uh, governor did an executive order last week, which is uh, altering the requirements for nursing homes. As you probably remember, he, he wanted to have all nursing home um, uh, personnel tested twice weekly for COVID. And now he's moving that only once weekly for those facilities that are located in, uh, in the regions that have reached, uh, re uh, that have reached uh, phase two. Um, I think a lot of folks are deeply concerned about what's happening with the civil rest, uh, unrest that was spurred by the, uh, you know, the death of George Floyd. Um, the only thing I can really say about this is that, you know, I've had a saying uh, in, uh, since college that, uh, you know, the time is, is always right to do what is right. And that's a saying that came from Martin L uh, Luther King Jr. S you know, folks, if you really look at it, uh, you don't really think of diversity when you, when you think of Tug Hill. But to be really honest, uh, if, you, if you look at the region in its entirety from south of Watertown, the Black River Valley, the Tug Hill region, uh, Core Forest, north of, you know, Anata Lake and Utica, or the I-81 corridor, uh, the majority of the folks that live here uh, at one time or another, if they lived here long enough, they were all immigrants. And I can remember many, many stories from my, my parents and my grandparents that because uh, they were uh, not white Anglo-Saxon coming into this area and not speaking English, they were uh, tremendously discriminated against. So it, it's, it's not something that we don't see here. We probably just see it a little different here on the Tug Hill region. But let, let's hope that, uh, that uh, this civil unrest has some positive and good things that come from it. And the death of George Floyd uh, is really not in vain and is not forgotten. And that my hopes are that the, the future of race relations can only can only get better uh, here in the region and also across the country. So, with that, also I guess the governor's been extremely busy. There's ten laws that are and amendments that are floating around Albany right now between uh, the Senate Majority Leader and also the Assembly Speaker. Um, anything that's uh, to, that pertains to amending the Civil Rights Act here in New York State and the uh, public officials law. Um, um, an executive law in relation to creation of office of special uh, investigation with the Office of Attorney General, uh, an act to amend the civil rights law, uh, an act to, to amend the penal law in relation to establishing a crime of aggregated strangulation. There's about 10 of them floating around right now. So they are, there is a tremendous amount of legislation here in New York State that I think you're going to see, that's going to see the, the, uh, the light of day, which is, is, is all very good, with good with very good from that. Moving on, you know, Katie and I have been talking about um, a uh, possible August retreat. You know, before you know it, August will be here, and we just wanted to get uh, the rest of the commissioner's opinion on uh, is the timing, number one, would be right for that. Uh, what options would we have to keep in mind that we got to continue to social distance and make it safe and be able to use you know, rest facilities, that type of thing. But I just want to throw that out to uh, everyone right now. Is anyone have any thoughts? Is it too soon? Is that something we should start planning here because it'll take a little bit to, to, to put something together? My thoughts are it's probably good to get together as a group if we're able to pass all the social distancing regulations. But uh, let's throw it out there. Anybody have any comments or questions on that? No. I think it's a good idea. I think yeah. we should. I should. Yeah. I definitely feel we should get together. Um, I think it's time. It's difficult to do business uh, not being face to face. Yep. But personally, I'm going to be excommunicated for a number of months yet, so you'll have to count me out of any um, get together. But. Well, I do we thought about we thought that. about that. What we could do is we could do is uh, you could be there by Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> be more than glad to Zoom in. <laughs> I'm getting used to that. <laughs> it's all Elena and uh, Jeannie's fault. 
<clears throat> any, any thoughts on what we could possibly do? Well, we, if we're going to zoom it, we have to be careful where we're having it. <laughs> yep. You know, we were just kind of throwing it out there right now. It's been quite a few years since we've been to Whetstone Gulf. I, I don't know what the regulations between now and then are going to be for the state, but I understand they're opening camping now. So I'm just wondering if they would allow some, you know, if the state would allow us to do something like that, or even maybe possibly Whitaker Park in Martinsburg. Yep. Yep. Where we met up in Glenfield. Was it Glenfield we met? What's that? That's Whitaker Park. Whitaker Park, yeah, that was a good place, I thought. Uh, uh, good pavilion, open air, easy yep. access. Uh, I'd be certainly in favor of going there. Yeah. You're, Whitaker Park, you're saying? Yes, yep. Whitaker Park. Yep. Katie, do you have any comments on that? I think you were going to reach out to yeah. uh, the... I reached out to um, Mary Kelly, the clerk in Martinsburg. Um, at this point in time, Whitaker Park is closed because things are, you know, still reopening and they, I guess the town's primary concern is meeting the regulations for cleaning the restrooms. Um, because I think there's a heightened need to clean on a very regular basis. Um, but I, so I, she said it otherwise, she, it would be fine. Um, certainly there's a lot of space there. I don't know what the internet connectivity would be there. I'd have to go up and check it out. I'm guessing, I don't know. Sometimes you're surprised at where it is and where it isn't. Um, I also did check real quickly to Whetstone Gulf this morning um, and their pavilions are not technically open yet either. Um, but again, things are changing on a weekly basis with all the regulations and the phases. So they said to check back. Yeah, the RV parks have been open for at least a couple of weeks. Yeah. RV, uh, for camping. The for camping has been open for a couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. I think between, between between now and when we have this, I think there's probably things will be changed. Okay, I see a comment from Felicia there. Uh, is is that uh, what what park is that? Is that the uh, uh, Whetstone Golf? Oh, okay, good. It is Whetstone, so it looks like they are. Um, they're gonna uh, they, so they'll be opening the um, the the beach. Well, I, 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 I'll keep track of some of that then, and maybe we'll do some recon on the um, internet connection at those places. Um, so Tom could be the talking head. What was that guy's name back in the 80s? I can't remember. Max Headroom. Max Headroom. He could be Max Headroom. <laughs> People much prefer me that way, I think, anyway. <laughs> Yeah. If there's any other thoughts, uh, like I, I, I do agree that we, we, it would be nice to get together as long as we can, uh, everyone feels safe and we can, uh, you know, uh, you know, live by the social distancing and we've got something that, uh, that as far as rest facilities that would work. I think it's important that we, uh, we get together sometime in, in August. That would be, that would, uh, that would be great. So any, any comments, you know, just basically run them by Katie and we'll, uh, We'll keep this on. We, we do have uh, another month here before we got to make a decision here. So, uh, any thoughts on the fall annual meeting? Well, really, as it relates to um, do we think we're going to have one? Do we think we need to cancel it? What's the thoughts? And usually, we, we're uh, usually what the second week of is it October or November? Um, the last few years we've done the Thursday after election day. Um, that has been a little bit problematic because um, a lot of town boards don't, that would meet, there, there's a, I can't remember, Angie, you'll have to remind me, but I know a lot of them end up rescheduling in November for that first Thursday. So we were considering moving it into October and trying to avoid um, conflicts with the land trust annual dinner, the NOCOG annual dinner, CTHC annual dinner, but all that's up in the air this year because who knows what's, what anyone's really gonna do. I think the land trust is at this point talking a virtual annual meeting. NOCOG has yeah. decided to cancel their annual meeting. Um, you know, we have to be ready to send inv invites for that out at 
the beginning of September. Um, so. Yeah, the uh, Thursday after election day is the deadline date for having the uh, public hearing on a town's uh, preliminary budget. And even though you can have it earlier, a lot of them think because that's the deadline, that's when they do it. So a lot of towns do wind up having their uh, public hearings on the uh, Thursday following the general election. So that is a, a busy night and it did con uh, cost us some attendance at the, uh, the last dinner. First year we did it, the first Thursday was before election. The last couple of years it's fallen after election. Yes, yeah, big difference. Things. It big depends difference. on what, what the calendar looks like. Yep. Okay. Well, we've got some time. If there's uh, any thoughts on that, uh, you know, let, let's hope that uh, things will look much different uh, as we uh, as we get into the fall here. So. Just want to throw that out there with that executive director report, Katie. Okay, I'm going to try to get fancy here and share my screen for a minute. Um, I sent all of you our return to work plan um, PDF on email, but I just wanted to throw it up on the screen. Um, so bear with me for a second. Sometimes this works easier than other times. And I have too many screens open and I'm working on a little laptop. So, um, see, can you see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yay. Yes. Okay. Very good, Katie. Yeah, so this was a template um, that Albany sent out to all the state agencies. You'll see at the top, it's, and, and it really required us to do a thorough evaluation of our operations and how we could start getting employees back in the workspace safely. Um, and so we went through this, um, Jean, Matt and I took a stab at it, then we shared it with all staff and we did a, work, a little work session Zoom to talk about what we were doing. Um, and it's a lot of what you're hearing already out there all the time about the six feet of distance. I'm just kind of um, scrolling through this. Uh, masks required when you're not in your own little office space, if there's a chance that you're going to come within six feet of someone else. Um, uh, a sneeze guard for Gwen Station. We've limited occupancy in any of the um, shared spaces, such as the copy room, the kitchen, the library. They're all signed. Um, we are keeping um, we've removed some things or moved them so we're not congregating or touching shared things, uh, trying to limit any contamination. We've posted some signage. Um, for, you know, two months basically where we're all at home, um, circuit riders and, and office staff, no meetings. We are starting to go to meetings now. Um, Circuit riders, some, some communities are still doing Zoom, but not a lot. They're starting to transition back into in-person meetings. Some of them are doing hybrid meetings. So uh, some people are actually in the, in the meeting room and some people are joining remotely. Um, so we're, the way it stands is circuit riders are contacting all the communities ahead of time to see what their, certain, their specific situation is. Uh, if a staff person can go and it's not going to push them over their 10 person limit and there's enough space for everyone to space out um, safely, they're starting to go back. Um, but it's a, a meeting by meeting determination. Um, as far as the Watertown office, we're, we have, we're keeping our maximum occupancy at 50%, which means no more than five people in the office at any given time. Um, we're really not accepting any visitors at this point. Uh, if someone absolutely needed to come into the office, we were requiring an appointment, but we don't get a lot of visitors anyway. We, you know, we are going to them most of the time. Um, some of this is repetitive. Uh, of course, we, we work in the state office building where lots of other agencies are located. There's lots of common areas. Um, in an unprecedented move that I've, I've never seen before, all of the state agencies kind of banded together and met with uh, OGS over a, a call and 
kind of were pretty strong about wanting to make sure everything was being enforced by OGS regarding elevator occupancies, regarding clean, cleaning bathrooms, limiting um, occupancy in bathrooms, hand sanitizing stations. Um, and OGS was pretty good about it. There are a few things that are, you kind of roll your eyes. Um, but, but for the most part, they're, they're doing a pretty good job. Um, I'm just going to scroll through this. So we have a stagger schedule. Um, we put together a little Excel sheet. We have week one, week two, who's in, who's out. It's <laughs> a little um, complicated and it's taking us a little bit to get in the groove, but I think it's pretty good. Um, we, are, we are required to do um, screening. I'm going to try to get to the spot that talks about screening. Um, Sorry for scrolling through this. We have to make sure everyone's um, supplied with uh, a mask, um, one, one mask per week. Um, and of course, people can use their own face coverings. We've, everyone has access to individual hand sanitizers, plus we have a big jug, couple big jugs of it available. Um, we've got cleaning protocols in, in place. If you touch anything, that's a shared item, one person at a time in the car. We have wipes in the car for disinfecting after use. Um, all um, staff, if you're gonna be in the, in the office, you have to do a, a fill out a screening form before you arrive and, or when you first get there, um, saying that your temperature is not over 100 or over, that you haven't tested positive for, uh, for COVID-19, that you haven't come into close contact with someone who's tested positive, and there's another question I forget. We've set that up in a Google form so people can just quickly fill it out and it populates a spreadsheet that I only have access to because our health, health um, what's the word I'm looking for? Requirements that we are not sharing information about people's health with others, um, so. HIPAA. Need to be careful. What was that? HIPAA. Right. HIPAA. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Um, we're, we're still doing a lot of email and Zoom meetings. Um, anyway, uh, uh, we do have a touchless thermometer in the office. If someone forgets to take their temperature before they come into the office, they can use that. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of what we're doing. Um, it's been a, 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 a learning curve, but everyone's been really good about it. And I think uh, hopefully we're making it work. And as far as I'm concerned, um, until we get new guidance from Albany, we'll continue doing it this way. Um, to our, the two DOS staff that share space in our office, Karen and Nancy, are still working entirely at home. Uh, Karen can't even get across the border. Remember, she lives uh, um, in Canada. Uh, so when they start to transition back, we'll have to brush things off and figure things out again, or if there's some new guidance from Albany. But that's what we're doing. Um, any uh, questions on any of that? Um, and stuff you had sent me last week, I think, might have been the week before even, um, you had indicated that you would accommodate staff with medical reasons and things like that as well. So Correct, just yep. Make sure everyone was aware of that. Yep, we sent out some other, uh, another email to staff. And if, if there's a medical concern uh, where they really can't re return to the workplace at all, um, if we have proper documentation, we will work through that with them. So definitely. And there's also other things available to staff. There's voluntary reduction work schedules. There's um, Family Medical Leave Act, that kind of thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Nice job, Kate. Yep. Thanks, Mike. Um, luckily, you know, there's a new testing tracker. I don't know if anyone's seen that online. It's, it's a little bit different than the previous trackers, if you will. This kind of keeps track of how many tests are done in each region on a daily basis and how many of those turn out positive. And luckily, things are still really, really low in our areas. I think it's pretty much 1% or less of all the tests are coming back positive. So. As long as things keep going well and people keep adhering to the, uh, all the requirements, hopefully the things will stay in a positive direction. Regarding budget bulletins, um, we have not gotten anything additional other than the two I had talked about last month regarding hiring freeze and real restrictions on non-personal service spending. 
Um, I'm expecting there might come, something might come at the end of June. Um, I know a lot of people have been waiting for some kind of additional federal stimulus to come and it doesn't seem like that's on the horizon. So I have been watching some trickle downs starting to happen with county layoffs. Um, Onondaga County over the weekend, I think announced some big layoffs. Um, Lewis County is doing some reductions in um, job sharing. Oneida County, I got it copied on an email from one of the towns in Oneida County that um, the county has eliminated the ditching contracts that they typically do with towns um, to do the ditch work in each of the towns. That's an income generator, I think, for a lot of the highway departments. So just things are, are tightening. You can, you can see it every day in the news and, and hear about it in our community. So we're trying to monitor that carefully. Um, some regional projects, some good news. Um, the Lorraine Worth Court Consolidation that we've been working on um, for a few years now, um, Matt and Angie, primarily myself a little bit, there's legislation required to make that court consolidation finalized. Um, that was actually passed last week by both the Assembly and the Senate now, since they're back to work. Um, that was one of the items on the agenda and it's passed. So that was really good news. And so that just awaits the governor's signature. That'll be a nice thing to check off the list and to have finished for those two towns. Uh, keeping up with the executive orders as uh, Jan was talking about earlier on um, is, an, is a whole job into, it, <laughs> into itself, um, trying to keep up with what's been extended and what the new advice to our communities should be as we were through phases. Um, we've been doing a pretty good job of that. NICOM just came out with a reopening um, guidance document at the end of last week. We're just, we're fielding a lot of questions regarding that. Uh, and it's, it's tough for everyone to try to figure out how they may keep doing work. And now that they're opening their offices a little bit more to the public, how they, how they keep safe. So that's, that's a lot of ongoing technical assistance. Uh, the commission map brochure was released uh, in the last Tuckle Times. When you have a chance, go on the website and check out the flip book that Elena was able to put together with that. Remember, we can't really print it right now given the budget um, restrictions, but we've done some a little bit different digital uh, publishing of that. It's, it's, kind of, it's kind of slick if you have um, the, the bandwidth to, to do the flip book. A quick uh, update on the Staying Connected initiative. You may have remembered our discussing that in the past. I'm gonna share my screen again and see if it works. Um, th this is a kind of a wide ranging um, project we've been working on for many years. Um, I have a picture here I wanna share. Okay. That uh, Jerry is very, very familiar with from both her time as a circuit rider and as a landowner in the area. Um, this is a map of the big staying connected initiative. It encompasses four states, three or four Canadian provinces. And the whole idea is to keep the habitat connected for wildlife movement between these areas um, in terms of climate change and changing um, conditions on the ground. It's, it's been going on for about 10 years. We still continue to be involved in it. I sit on the steering committee. Um, there's work in the linkage area. We are this little purple um, arrow here. There's some additional uh, interest in expanding the linkage um, or expanding the work in New York to connect to the Catskills. So there's another connection that's going to occur down in this area to connect this big, the big Catskill forested area. And uh, an interesting thing happened back in 2016. There's a New England governor's Canadian premier's joint group that meets and they passed a resolution, which so it's a pretty high level policy resolution supporting this wildlife connectivity work in those areas. Unfortunately, New York is not part of that group. It's the New England governors and New York doesn't go with New England. They go with the middle mid Atlantic. Um, which is too bad because there's a big working group going um, put together to kind of implement that policy document. So 
we are involved with trying to get New York on board, um, especially with the expansion to the CAT skills. It'll make it a little bit more holistic for, for New York to look at it. Um, I've been involved in some discussions. We had a meeting in Albany before COVID. Um, we'd like to do some more outreach. There's different leadership at DEC now. Um, we also need to get the governor's office on board, but this is a, it's a really kind of cool regional project that gets at a lot of why Tug Hill is considered a special you know, natural resource area. We, we're connected to this whole big, big uh, region and uh, we've, the work locally uh, has been quiet the last few years. Um, we, we've worked with communities on comprehensive plans, getting some language in those comp plans about wildlife connectivity. We've done some transportation work, the Route 12 corridor, an underpass was built in, in a culvert a few years ago. There was landowner work, Jerry's very familiar with cameras on lands here to see what kind of animals are moving back and forth. Um, we're hoping it, it, we can pick that back up a little bit. Uh, a lot of people are excited about moose these days. I don't know, Larry, if you, or Larry, I said Larry, because you, you say Larry Ritter on your screen, Jerry, but I don't know, Jerry, if you've seen any moose in there. There's been sightings in the area. And people have also said they've seen mountain lions. I don't know. I haven't seen any photographs. I had heard that uh, had happened last year in Lewis County, but I've heard that in this area this year. But people, it's exciting to, to see those big, I don't know about the mountain lions, so people are a little bit more scared about that, but the, I know that most <laughs> people get very, very excited about. Yeah. yeah. So I just wanted to do a brief update on, on that project um, as it's continued and is evolving with hopefully some more New York um, high level involvement. Uh, let's see, where was I? Um, some update on some upcoming training and webinars that we are hosting uh, later this week. Angie will do, be doing a presentation, a webinar on justice courts options for small communities. Uh, this is to build on the work we've been doing over the years. Um, Lorraine Worth is the, the latest example, but Harrisburg Montague Pinckney, you'll remember. Um, Boylston, we've given assistance to, Lewis and Osceola. So we've gotten a little bit of uh, expertise in this. Um, Angie's done a few presentations in Albany about it. Uh, there was a group in Hamilton County that wanted us to come over and present to them. Of course, this COVID has put a um, a wrinkle in that plan. So we decided to try to offer something via a webinar. I didn't check this morning, right? Uh, last week, end of last week, we had about 25 people signed up. I'm sure it's gotten more um, since then. So that should be um, interesting. And hopefully we get some of those Hamilton County people to join us. They might have some internet connectivity issues though for a webinar. So it's I don't really know. It's really bad even for cell phones for there. So like speculators, it's, it's bad. Yeah, I know. I feel bad. I, we're trying to get this information to them, and I don't, <laughs> we can't go there. So, um, other webinars we have coming up is June 23rd. Um, what, again, another LGC session that we weren't able to um, provide is transparency and comprehensive planning. Matt Horn from the M um, NRB group is doing that. I think we were up to close to 100 the last time I checked uh, for registrations for that one. And then on June 25th, this is a little different for us, um, and we're partly doing it because we have the Zoom webinar capabilities, which gives us the up to 500 people participating. But the Jefferson County Economic Development um, Agricultural um, Group and um, Farm Credit East are putting on a webinar about agriculture and the road to recovery, a path to 2025. As many of you are aware, ag has taken a big hit um, with COVID as well as everyone else. Um, there was milk dumping at the beginning of this. Hopefully, I think that's abated a little bit. Nourish New York has helped get some of the ag products out of the region and into the populated areas. But I think there's some long-term implications for how um, dairy and meat get processed. Um, is, there's a lot more interest in local foods, so this, this is going to be a webinar. They, they brought in a, a kind of world-renowned um, economic or ag economic um, analyst to talk about what he sees as um, the future and some trends. And then we've got Nathan Rug Ruggers. Um, he's with Farm Credit East. He had been the ag commissioner here in um, New York State many years ago. 
they're going to talk about what they see for the future. So that should be a good one as well. Then we've approached Constable Hall about possibly having a series with them. We know they've been struggling um, with um, the hall having to be closed. Um, museums don't open till phase four. Uh, so they are, they've still been closed, although the garden's been open. Uh, we, we've got to talk a little bit more with John Constable and Peter Hayes about that, but we were trying to figure out a way to help them deliver some programming over the summer. Um, <clears throat> Lastly, um, Elena and Carla have um, been working hard on the broadband issue. Um, they've got a group together made up of various um, organizations meeting on a biweekly basis, I believe, to talk about how we move the dial on broadband. Lots of conversations with other organizations to learn what they've been doing, um, including um, some people from the Adirondack Park Agency, from the Catskills. Um, we're trying to get uh, con new, a new contact with the broadband office. The person we worked with before doesn't seem to be there anymore. Um, Dank is part of that. Um, some Cornell and SU. So um, that's a long-term project, but a, a hugely important one for the region. Uh, so I don't know, there was an article in the um, Tug Hill Times a couple weeks ago. I'm not sure if that generated any interest. Um, I don't know if Carla or Elena would want to say anything about that. I'll just say that we're meeting tomorrow with a, a committee, I guess you can call us, um, working on this research project. It, it, like Katie said, it's going to be long term, most likely going into the end of summer of next year, but potentially longer depending on how things develop. But we're off to a good start. Carla uh, has sent letters to school districts to request some information on what households or at least region areas of school districts have uh, poor access or affordability issues and we're going to start making some coverage maps. So I know as that thing, as those things start coming together, we'll share it with Katie and surely she'll share it with all of you. Thank you, Elena. I wasn't sure if somebody else was trying to talk. Um, so that's um, pretty much all I had. Any questions for me on any of those items? No. Katie, did did I tell you last month about the, the broadband coming to Osceola? Yes, you did mention that, Leona. Is this, have you seen any more activity? Oh my gosh, they're all over. They're all over. They're cutting trees, they're setting poles, they're running wires. They're, it's just Crazy. like a bunch of bees all over. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> That's Unfortunately, awesome. Unfortunately, in my library, we have Windstream in my library and my contract with them is until February 2022. So I'm not going to be able to hook up very quickly, which is stinks. <laughs> Who's the service provider in Osceola with this new project? Well, Verizon's doing a lot of work, but I think Spectrum is involved also. Yeah. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, I think I think it's going to be a Verizon system off their lines. Hmm. I would hope it would well, be I'm anyways. They're, they're setting poles for uh, Niagara Mohawk. Verizon is. I think that's amazing. <laughs> Cooperation. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They'll probably, uh, they'll probably provide cable TV too. I would imagine. Oh yeah. I think it'll be the oh, full yeah, yeah. spectrum. Um, in North Redfield, uh, we have Frontier, which is going bankrupt. Uh, and Spectrum, they're not going to run lines here and there. I don't know. It's kind of a mess up here. Um, I hope Verizon buys out uh, Frontier because I think they're the best system. I don't have good reports from um, on Spectrum. I'll tell you that. <laughs> hmm. Okay, good. Anything else, Katie? That's it. I was just looking at our schedule of meetings here, and it looks like uh, we're not really scheduled to to meet. 
either by Zoom or in, in person until September 15th in the Central Square. So if anyone has any comments or, uh, you know, either staff or commissioners on how we could accomplish this uh, retreat in August, if you want to just run them through Katie, we'll have some time to make a decision on this, but we're not going to have a meeting prior to that. So uh, if everyone stays flexible, we'll try and accommodate everybody if we can. Uh, if not, we'll give it a gallon, uh, at least a gallon attempt here. Uh, any, any questions on that? No. No, we did okay. have um, some circuit rider reports if you want to yep. talk, talk through those a few to Jan. Yeah. How do you want to handle it? Uh, do you want to each handle it or do you want to do it? Yeah, no, I, I queued them up. I think they're ready to, to share a little bit. All right, go ahead. Why don't you take, take it over then? Um, Jean, do you want to first talk about no cause? Yeah. Hi, everyone. It's nice to see you guys. Hey, Jean. Um, I'd like to introduce John Hilt. Um, I don't know if you've noticed him sitting there outside on his deck in the beautiful sunshine. John is the uh, circuit writer that we um, interviewed and offered the job to. Uh, unfortunately, we can't hire him until the budget situation is a little more uh, stable. Um, and we get the go ahead from Albany. But John Hill, John said that he would be willing to wait and um, he is still doing the contract work for NOCOG. Um, I'm, I'm trying to gear him up, at least, at least feed him some of the uh, other projects um, and get him geared up a little bit. One of the um, projects that we're working on is the, um, uh, I don't know if, if you all remember or if you were told that um, last year NOCOG purchased two, un two U GPS units uh, for the COG. Um, and Mickey was able to get uh, the village of Holland, pa Remsen, and the town of Camden. Uh, geared up and working on some projects last year. Um, we're trying to get them geared up again to start working on that. Um, I've um, we, we have to figure out if uh, what they're doing and um, how much longer they need the units and 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 how much longer they'll take to um, finish up their projects because we have two other communities interested in the units. Uh, the, the town of Annsville would like to do some water, uh, some uh, public water related projects and some highway stuff. And the village of Sylvan Beach um, has a whole list of things that they would like to do. So as soon as we um, are able to finish up those projects in uh, Remsen and Camden, We'll get them to um, Annsville and Sylvan Beach, uh, hopefully with Mickey's assistance on training. Um, there's also the possibility of a, an intern or a part-time person um, to do some of this GPS work. Uh, NOCOG has some money that they would like to dedicate or has dedicated to um, paying someone if the community is needed. Uh, Katie was able to put together a job description of this uh, for this person. We're just, <clears throat> we're at the, at the beginning part of trying to figure all this out. And I've asked Carla to kind of spearhead it all and she's got it all down on paper. She's making some of the contacts. Um, and hopefully between Carla and John and Mickey, we can uh, get this project off the, off the ground. It's exciting. Um, I think the, the units will come in very handy for, for NOCOG. Um, the other uh, comment I just wanted to make or let you guys know is that um, Katie mentioned that NOCOG has decided not to hold their annual dinner in September or annual meeting slash dinner in September. And in lieu of that, they are going to be sending out 
to all their members um, their budget and a ballot um, because at their annual um, meeting they they approve a budget uh, for NOCOG and they elect office uh, the, the executive board officers um, so they do conduct business um, so in lieu of the meeting we're going to have we're going to be sending out a, um, a mail ballot and some um, information on the budget and ask their representatives, NOCOG representatives, to send it in by mail. Um, I don't know. I can't remember. Is there anything else you wanted me to touch on, Katie? There's a lot going on in NOCOG. We're trying to keep up with uh, between um, John and Harlan and staff here in the office, we're trying to cover all the NOCOG uh, Town and Village board meetings. Planning, um, Matt and Elaine have been um, covering some zoning board and planning board meetings but by Zoom. Um, I think we're going to see more and more of those meetings being held in person in July and August moving forward. But um, there were quite a few meetings that um, staff has assisted with Zoom meetings for, for NOCOG um, board meetings. I know I just got an email from Harlan. He had, con he had talked to Wanda in the clerk in uh, Sylvan Beach this morning, and they're interested in doing a Zoom meeting tonight for their board meeting. So there are, there are still some Zoom meetings going on, but I think in July, we're gonna see a lot more in-person meetings. Jane, first where it's gonna meet in person this week. Yeah, okay. They're not gonna do Zoom, they're gonna have an in-person meeting on Wednesday. Also, uh, sometime, I think it was in the beginning of this year or late 2019, uh, the county executive appointed someone new for the Commissioner of Planning. Uh, you know, John had retired a few years ago and Regina Vitozzi, who'd been there for a long time, was acting commissioner. And it was kind of a given that it would be her and it was not. Oh. So, uh, and I kind of forgot who it was, but it was somebody from a different department. And I know it gets close to the time where they're looking at a request for NOCOG, you know, every every summer. So, you know, there may have to be more background material. But uh, the staff um, was upset that it wasn't Regina. Yeah, I can imagine. So she'd yeah. been second in the in command for quite a while, and wow. had really picking up the slack and. They had had some retirements in the past two years, and she was really the logical choice. So, is she still going to stay? Is she still there? As far as I know, she is. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The um, the executive board met a couple weeks ago, and they talked about the, the contract with the county. We put together a letter, but that's good to know that Regina is not there. Um, yeah. Hmm, interesting. Okay, thanks, thanks Jane. Jane. And just uh, real quick, uh, uh, welcome, John, and um, thank you for being patient <laughs> with uh, with us in the state. Uh, good things come with time, so we uh, we do uh, we, we do want to welcome you, and we appreciate you being patient on that. Real quick, Jean, uh, that your background is that the Keystone Bridge in Florence? Yes, it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought nice background. The commissioners would appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Angie, do you want to CTHE stuff? Yeah. Sure. Uh, I just got to add my own two cents. Hang in there, John. It took a year and a half for my position <laughs> to get filled. So <laughs> just stay strong. You can do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, as Jean mentioned, quite a few of my towns this month even are, uh, some of them have been meeting in person right along, the ones that have the bigger halls and can space out. Some of them have been doing Zoom. And so this month we've got quite a mixed bag. I've got some meeting in person, some doing hybrid meetings where part of the board is there and the public is in through Zoom and some still doing straight Zoom. So we've got a mixed bag. 
um, my executive committee approved um, me to write up a contract amendment for my associates, a little policy on how to go to the meetings and be safe. Um, when I, I started going back case by case, we uh, put that in effect for my associates as well. So they have both agreed to that. Now it's just a matter of me trying to get signatures without being face to face with people. Um, but so my ladies are also going to meetings uh, on a case by case basis as their best judgment and the board's best judgment. Uh, what's going on in my towns? My uh, villages and the couple of towns that have sewers uh, systems are working most of them on the new disinfection systems that have got to be in place um, uh, because of DEC regulation changes. So a lot of them are working with engineers um, and grants and whatever to get the, those things updated. Uh, also, Constable Bill's looking for a new water plant operator because their water plant operator resigned. Not that they were real thrilled with him anyway. Um, I did hear uh, in Harrisburg's last meeting that uh, there's a new representative for the Deer River project. Uh, Walter Meisner's not there anymore, but Steve didn't have a name. So as soon as I try and run it, run it down, Katie, I will let you know who that is. Um, uh, at that point, he said he was just in contact with Dan Murdy. So I don't know if there's an official new Avangrid person yet or not. Um, uh, Martinsburg, like I said, that's one of my places. It's got a sewer study going on. They've also got a, a water project going on and they're looking at possibly another one. Um, their fire department has been in with quite a few questions about um, fire tax because of the pilot, the new pilot for Maple Ridge and the way the um, assessed value of the towers comes down, plus with the Roaring Brook one just getting going. There have been some questions there. So um, the board has been trying to get some solid answers for their fire department on fire tax and what it's going to do to the town payers who haven't been paying anything for many years as far as fire tax is concerned. Um, they've also uh, got a request to put some suggested speed signs on Flat Rock Road when the Warring Brook project construction gets going to slow the ATVs down on that road. Um, so they're working on that. Um, <laughs> Montague, well, several of the towns have been having beaver problems. Montague has, has got a permit from the DEC and their highway guys have gotten rid of 20 beavers so far that are flooding their roads. So that's good. Pinckney also having some beaver issues. Um, that's funny. That's a problem you never hear of anywhere but Tug Hill probably. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Montague is having problems. They have Frontier uh, at their town hall and their landline has been out on and off quite a lot, like six days last month, their landline was down. Uh, so they've been trying to talk about other ways that they might be able to do it, like a voice over phone through the internet, but then they lose the facts. Um, so they're, they're at least gonna try and talk to Frontier about some credits for the days that it's down and, and hope that something comes about after the Frontier, whatever happens with them. But they've been having quite a lot of problems there. And of course, as most everybody knows, there's not much cell phone service up there at the Montague Town Hall. So if the landline is out, you're out of luck, pretty much. Um, Redfield, is. Uh, I went to their meeting in person uh, last week. They are uh, working on a driveway installation law and a few other things. Um, uh, Leona, I wanted to let you know that there there's going to be a food giveaway Thursday of this week, the 18th in Redfield for Osceola and Redfield and Orwell people. So if you see anybody that might um, be interested, four starts at four on Thursday. Sorry, that was a little aside from my duties from the Redfield meeting. Um, uh, Turin, their county legislator was talking about some of the stuff Katie was talking about. Uh, they have furloughed uh, 26 employees and through the end of July, their legislators and a bunch of their other administrative personnel have taken pay cuts um, to try and help with the the big deficit that everybody's got. They also are working, they've been working on a, a law to regulate large gatherings after the mess with the SNRT run last year. Um, I think it kind of expanded a lot bigger than they wanted it to, so now they're trying to bring it back down, but the, so they don't have a, a law yet, but they're working on it there. Um, Turin is one of my places with some new people. They've got a new highway superintendent, whatever. He's been doing a lot of work. They're very happy with him. Um, they, uh, so they're, they, they are moving to, they moved to in person this month, but they had been one of my Zoom meetings. Uh, Village of Turin had one of their trustees resign. Um, they are, they only have two trustees um, and a mayor. So <laughs> they're pretty tight. If somebody's not around, one of their trustees resigned and they re, they appointed somebody to take his spot at the next, um, at the, at 
at, at this board meeting coming up. They are also the only one of my villages that are elections are supposed to be in March. So their village elections have been pushed back to September. They are attempting to change it to run in November like everybody else because they get very low turnout, obviously with the March thing in such a small village, but they're midstream of it. So they have to wait till this election can go through. So their, their village elections in September at this point in time. Uh, Williamstown and Florence are both working on salt shed projects. They're both moving along swiftly. The both the, the basis for both of those should be done within the next little bit, and then the buildings will start going up after that. Uh, we helped both of them with the grants for those, not last year, but the year before. Uh, also, big news for anyone on this end of the county, there's a new store coming to Williamstown. There's a Dollar General, I believe, or Family Dollar, one of them going in. Uh, right where Great White North used to be on 13. So that's pretty exciting news for somebody that has to drive all the way to Pulaski if I need a roll of toilet paper. Um, <laughs> uh, and Worth, uh, this month they met in person. They have been doing Zoom. Um, they met at the highway garage so they could spread out because everyone knows their town hall is tiny. Um, so I had Carly go with me. Carly, or UK used to cover their meeting, but with all the stuff they've had going on, I've been covering them for quite some time. So I had Carly go with me so she could be introduced. I think at this point with the court thing being just about done and things settled down a little bit, she's gonna be covering them. Although I told them that I'd be more than happy to come whenever they needed me or whatever. But she ended up being there until quarter to nine because, <laughs> and they started at five because they've been meeting by Zoom and it's been like 20 minute meetings for the last couple of months. So that she was, she had welcome to Worth. Nice long meeting for your first one. Uh, they've had, they have a resident that lives on a road um, that's asking about the town maintaining it and at this, the, it's been told to him that it's not a town road or blah, 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 blah. So their attorney anyway is trying to figure out the status of the road and whatever to find out what they can or can't do. They also are in the midst of trying to buy a piece of property to put up a new town hall, town barn type of facility. But needless to say with the court shutdowns, they're having trouble getting the abstract. So they're still working on that. Um, other than that, I am trying to set up a, an executive committee meeting for the 23rd of this month, which I hope to have done. I'm just waiting to hear back from a couple of my people. I told you about the contract amendments um, for my associates. I've got a cooperative zoning board of appeals uh, hearing coming up at the end of this month as well. And we have not made a decision yet as far as fall dinner. So I'll let you know as soon as we do. Uh, we did our spring dinner stuff uh by mail because that's when we do uh, balloting my existing slate of officers was re-elected by unanimous i got votes back from everybody uh approving the slate and the goals for this year which is the business we had to have done before may 30th so uh that did get accomplished and that's all i've got unless you've got any questions about the middle of the hill you gotta know <laughs> <laughs> all right i'm gonna step out so uncle mike can sit <laughs> mickey yeah, um, so basically been just zooming around. <laughs> We're doing a lot of Zoom meetings. Uh, most of my communities at this point are still doing Zoom meetings this month, all except for I think two. And then um, starting next month, I'm hearing most of the communities are going to go back to in-person meetings, but some are talking about doing a hybrid thing. So um, might be looking for some program staff to cover if we need to have a Zoom set up because I might be going to attend those meetings in person. Um, but uh, one of the things we do, do have for Ray Cog is we did get a Fort Drum intern. Um, this intern's name is Peter McCain. He's retiring out of Fort Drum. And some of the things, just a quick thing, but like his interest is in community and economic development. Uh, he was a troop commander and chief executive officer um, for about 100 member reconnaissance troop in Afghanistan. One of the interesting things was he was an assistance operations manager and planner for a 450 member reconnaissance squadron in which he uh, uh, he oversaw $5 million of funding to support economic development programs in the Zari district in Afghanistan. He also coordinated with US and Afghan uh, government agencies to develop and support economic development programs in the Zari district for Afghanistan. So. His goal is when he retires out of Fort Drum is he wants to go back to his home state of Pennsylvania and would like to get into doing economic development. So he'll be with us starting July 1st until the end of August. So we're kind of pulling together some projects potentially for him to get started on. And we might even have him do some mapping of sidewalks for some of the communities. So 
he'll be coming on board. And then one of the major things going on right now is the LED lighting project. Um, just briefly, but that uh, back a little while ago, probably about three months ago or so, um, National Grid went and relooked at how they gave out the original buyback quotes and redid their formulas for calculating the price. So halted all projects on that. Um, communities are just starting to get the new buyback quotes um, back and we're seeing anywhere from a 50% to 700% increase in our costs now to buy back their lighting. Um, which is kind of put the project up in the air a little bit right now. Uh, the New York Power Authority was going to have a meeting with the Public Service Commission and National Grid last week. It got postponed to this week, so we'll probably learn a little bit more what comes out of that. Um, from what I heard, when National Grid talked about, you know, changing the formula and stuff, it wasn't supposed to succeed, uh, exceed 4% increases. And what happened is that happened for one specific group that was further along than everybody else, but then everybody else has seen major increases for the most part. Um, so they're going to try to work work through that and work out something there on, on that for that project. Um, let's see, Katie, did you want to cover complete streets or Jean, or did you want me just to touch upon that? Yeah, I kind of skipped over that. You could talk about it real, real briefly. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just going to mention that I did actually, so the complete streets was, that's the BOCES. We're having the BOCES uh, students work on projects for uh, some of the communities like Carthage and Copenhagen. Uh, just quickly, things are going along good. We got things, I think, a plan in place moving forward. I did meet with one of the teachers uh, for the carpentry class in, Lark, uh, in Watertown with Wayne McElroy with Walk Carthage Park. And uh, and out of that, what I did find out just recently is that they will be able to build the boardwalks on site with the students. So that, Gene, just so you know, too, that was something originally we they weren't going to be able to do. But I guess the principal over in Watertown said that she thought that would be a good thing to have the students out there. So they're going to swing that so we don't have to worry about that. So that'll be moving forward with the, that. And that's going to include Besides the boardwalk for Carthage, we got park benches. We got uh, you know, in Copenhagen, they have benches, bike racks, picnic tables, um, kiosks. So there's a lot of projects going on with that. So they'll continue to move forward. And then other than that, it's just a lot of little uh, comp plan. I know Elaine and Matt are looking to get that started back up once the communities are ready um, to start meeting again. And so that'll be moving forward also. So that's all I got. Yep. And the other community that got some um, things out of the, the complete streets was Lions Falls. At the, they got um, ordered some, I can't remember, but they did get some benches and that kind of thing. Um, uh, Paul, do you want to talk about Sam Rivers and NORCOG? And I'll start sharing my screen, so it'll take me a minute. Oh, sure. Thank you, Katie. Uh, one of the, uh, the uh, thing that is... Uh, suffered during this period uh, of COVID and not travel and so on was uh, before this uh, period came on, uh, the upcoming improvement to the Cleveland docks had been planned, but we weren't sure when it was going to start. Uh, it had been delayed uh, previously because of uh, the state demand for contractors to help with uh, rising water levels of Lake Ontario and mitigating measures there. So this project had already been delayed and then we came to the uh, construction season this year and things were, uh, well, things were impacted across the board, of course, with uh, COVID-19. Well, when this meeting today was coming up, Katie said, well, what's going on with the Cleveland dock? And I hadn't been down to Cleveland routinely because I wasn't allowed to be down in Cleveland routinely and I wasn't traveling on a personal basis there. So I called the uh, Cleveland Village clerk and she said, oh yeah, there's uh, all kinds of good stuff going on there and uh, they're well into the project and they uh, are expecting to be done by July 4th. So I took a run, now that I'm allowed to travel again, I took a run down to uh, Cleveland on Friday and it was a beautiful sunny day and very pleasant. And I took these pictures that uh, Katie is sharing that I shared to the uh, Tug Hill server 
Uh, the project is well underway. You can see the uh, concrete work that they've done, uh, replacing the old uh, rotted uh, timber and uh, sheet metal uh, pilasters and, and uh, retainers that were keeping the dock from falling into the uh, Oneida Lake. And uh, it looks really good and really strong. And uh, it looks like they're well along the way to being able to uh, accomplish things by uh, July 4th, as the village clerk indicated. So now that I know this is underway, I'll probably be making some periodic trips down to Cleveland to document the project. As I mentioned to Katie, when I went down to uh, Cleveland on Friday, I accomplished three things out of it. I got a chance to uh, bring back a report that we could report to the commissioners on Monday. Uh, I can put it up on the Cleveland Village website, uh, which people are visiting. And I can get a Tug Hill Times article out of it because this is a Tug Hill Times week. So, uh, and we're always looking for good uh, community information in, for the Tug Hill Times. So you've seen the pictures and uh, looks like things are going well there. And I'm grateful that after uh, years and years of uh, our persistence and Cleveland's persistence along with us, because of course we wouldn't be persisting in it if the, Cle the village of Cleveland didn't think it was important. So it's uh, very, uh, very gratifying to see uh, the progress that they've made there. So that's a huge project. I mean, they're talking yeah. million, like a million dollar investment at the very least. I mean, you're yeah. just seeing the structural stuff so far, which if you saw before, we should do a before and after at some point. But um, yeah. then once all that's done, there is a whole set of plans and I think some money already uh, allocated to do the improvements, the pretty stuff, right? The the yeah. amenities kind of thing. So that's going to be really big for the North Shore of Nile Lake. Yeah, I'm, I'm very pleased to see how it's, uh, how it's taking place. Very good project. Um, other things going on in the area. Um, County Route 22 is now closed at uh, Bennett's Bridge uh, by the, the hydro plant. It's uh, again, one of those things that I think I attended the first uh, public hearing on that uh, public informational meeting several years ago, and it's been put off more than once, and uh, they're finally getting getting down to it. So the uh, Bennett's Bridge uh, County Route 22 is closed down. Um, when I attended the public information meeting, if memory serves, I think they're talking about it taking literally a year or two. So it's a big, big project that's going to take a, a while and it's going to affect my route traveling from where I am up to, uh, to Orwell. Not greatly. There's an alternate route that I can travel around that's uh, not quite as direct, but it's almost as short. So it's not a big, big impact, but it's just a little bit different way of traveling up there than I'm used to. Um, so that's uh, going on in, in Orwell. Uh, Town of West Monroe. Town of West Monroe has been uh, contemplating expanding sewer services in the area because there are places that need it. And um, it, the other benefit would be for economic development where there are areas of town that if they had sewer available, they already have water available in places. And it would definitely uh, impact their ability to uh, attract businesses. There are some businesses that have located in Central Square that they looked at West Monroe first and decided to go to Central Square because Central Square had sewer. So West Monroe has lost business as a result of not having sewers. And uh, so there are multiple reasons for Cleveland, or excuse me, West Monroe to want sewers. Uh, they put out some money uh, to get some engineering work done. And the engineering work they got back is it turns out uh, wasn't quite what they needed because they were relying on an engineering company to give them what they needed. And the engineering company said, well, you weren't specific, so this is what you got. So the town is currently looking how to take things the, uh, the next step uh, in Parish, with Parish Water, which I'll get back to in a minute. Parish of uh, town and village, they wound up uh, going, getting some uh, technical assistance from Dank and uh, to help them manage their project, which is a service that Dank offers. Uh, this is an outgrowth of a uh, workshop that we sponsored last fall in Altmar on uh, assistance to municipality for water and wastewater. 
one of the speakers at that meeting was a, uh, a speaker from Dank, and uh, Parrish wound up following up with that to see if they might be able to provide some assistance to Parrish and walking them through the process because they, they're not water experts and they're not uh, project management experts. So they got, uh, they signed up Dank, and I'll, like I said, I'll get back to that in a minute, Parish Water. But uh, West Monroe approached Dank to see whether Dank would be available to provide similar services to West Monroe. And Dank, after consideration, declined on that. They said that uh, they took a look at where West Monroe was in terms of distance and what their current workload is, and uh, that they wouldn't be able to assist West Monroe uh, with that at this time. So that's a little bit of a setback for West Monroe because again, West Monroe is kind of in the same position with sewer that Parrish was with water. They need to know somebody who can help them know what they need to know and not just what somebody is trying to sell them. So uh, I'm not sure yet exactly how that's going to move forward. I think they've got a meeting coming up uh, with DEC to talk about things further. Uh, Okay, so now back to the uh, Parish situation and water. Parish uh, has been working with Dank. Uh, it's been, I think, a very, very good thing for Parish because they've got somebody who's clearly knowledge knowledgeable, knows the ins and outs, uh, knows the process and how it needs to move forward, uh, is well organized and is on top of uh, deadline dates. Uh, at this point, uh, Parrish has a uh, engineering firm selected to help them move forward, and everything seems moving forward as well as possible, considering that the water project probably did suffer a little bit. They were really just starting up with Dank at a time a whole COVID-19 situation uh, kicked in, and that delayed things. There were some town board members who didn't want to meet via Zoom and didn't want to make any big decisions if everybody wasn't there physically present with each other to work on the water project. So uh, that delayed the project somewhat, but uh, they are they are moving forward on it. And as I said, Dank has been a big, uh, big help to them. I think it hasn't, hasn't been something that hasn't cost them money. It has, but uh, I think it's been a worthwhile investment compared to the alternative, which would probably be not having a water project at all for some time. Um, another thing going on with Parrish that uh, Katie and I have been talking about something over the last several years. There is interest from the uh, village of Parrish with the Little Salmon River and getting salmon upstream from Ontario up to Parrish. There are a couple dams downstream from uh, Parrish that has been an impediment to that. Uh, we brought in friend Bert Leva and some other folks from DEC to meet with Parrish in the past about what the uh, impediments were to getting uh, salmon upstream and into uh, Parrish and, and other recreational uses as well that would be possible if the dams weren't there. And I understand uh, from Katie that apparently one of the uh, downstream dams now is uh, been compromised and uh, that might op open up an opportunity to uh, remediate the dam in a uh, form factor that's more friendly to accommodating uh, its natural uh, form as opposed to the uh, structure it's had in the past with the dam. So again, I'm looking forward to seeing how things might be able to move forward on that. Uh, and I think that is everything I had on my list of things to mention. That's mm -hmm. uh, lots going on even in this COVID era. Thanks, Paul. And I think that's a good point. Um, I think there's been a backlog. A lot of things kind of been pushed back during COVID. Now things are starting to free up a little bit. And so I think there's a little bit of catch up being played. But it'll be interesting because I think the budget stuff's gonna, gonna limit some of the ability to do things that cost money um, for the foreseeable future. So, it, you know, there's no CFAs that has not been announced. I, I haven't heard anything. I don't know if they're going to have CFAs this year. I, it, it's just going to be a new world to be doing business in for some time, as we know. It's, I guess I'm pointing out the obvious, but um, yeah, that's to, one, one thing I can uh, I'll, I'll throw in as well is that my communities have already started taking a look as the counties are, uh, my communities are looking at how they can. Uh, 
spend within their budget and in the light of possible uh, decreased uh, revenues. Uh, one of the big items of uh, contention right now, given the time of year, is how much do we want to put into uh, highway work and into paving. In one way, it's a really good year to be looking at doing paving because petroleum costs obviously are down, which affects the cost of, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the cost of paving. But the question is, is how far out on that limb do you want to go? Uh, there are, there's talk that chips may be available, but maybe not be at 100% because again, the state has been talking about some forms of aid being reduced by say 20%. So the municipalities are wondering how far out on that limb to go when they may not be reimbursed as they were expected to. Uh, I don't remember whether I mentioned this before, so I'll mention it now. Uh, Oswego County uh, has a $4 million uh, paving budget. And at one of their legislative meetings earlier, they decided that of that 4 million, they were only going to allocate 500,000 of it for paving for now. And they're going to do that and see how far it went and then reevaluate based on <coughs> how information had uh, evolved. They weren't going to necessarily going to spend all the money that they budgeted because you know when you're budgeting money it depends on revenues coming in i found this on the web my, my phone's talking to me <laughs> uh, one thing to, to budget money and it's another thing to have the revenues to back it up to be able to pay the bills when they come in and that's something that the county is unsure of of course i'm sure you've heard that uh, the re recent revenue uh, estimates are on sales tax are down 25 to 30 percent and that's uh that's a big hit for a major source of their their revenue so uh Thanks everybody's so taking a look at how to how to proceed in in that way so that's it for Congress. i gotta ask a question paul on your background there is that is that the intersection of 49 and railroad street in bernard's bay uh, actually, it's beautiful downtown Cleveland, and I can tell you a short story about that and another one of the impacts of COVID. Uh, Cleveland and Constantia, the VFW and the American Legion, uh, traditionally have a uh, combined effort to do a uh, Memorial Day parade, and it alternates between the two municipalities. This year, it was scheduled for the uh, village of Cleveland. So this is a, a streetscape of Route 49 in Cleveland. And the brick building you see in the background is the uh, phone system building that's right next to the uh, village hall. Uh, they did not do the parade this year. They did do a small uh, memorial ceremony with uh, the fire departments and the uh, American Legion and the VFW. Uh, just a, a small ceremony with appropriate physical distancing and uh, separation and masks and, and all of that. But we, we did do a ceremony to uh, honor the, the fallen war dead. And I was grateful to be in Cleveland that day and uh, be able to participate in that. And that's the picture I snapped that day. Yeah, it looks familiar, that's fine. <laughs> yep, yep, Route 49, Route 49 yeah. in Cleveland. Yep, thanks, uh, thanks Paul. Katie, uh, finance report. Um, I sent that um, out via email this morning. Uh, we've almost finished up with uh, 1920 budget. There's still a few outstanding expenditures, but uh, and we'll have a end of year um, report for you uh, at our next business meeting. But just wanted you to see where we stood. Um, I'm not going to take the time to go through it. We went through a lot of budget stuff in detail last month. Um, and then you also have um, the first financial statement of this year, uh, which um, doesn't show a lot for expenditures. Obviously, we're only a little bit in and we've been not spending very much money at all. So we've got some personnel costs in there. We've paid our um, attorney for the year. So we've got Lee on board and um, we had to fix one of the vehicles and uh well we fixed them both i think one might have been in last fiscal year and one's in this fiscal year but we do have two operational vehicles although we weren't able to repair that rav or, or i mean replace the rav like we had hoped but so any questions felicia's on too no no okay well thank you um Public comments. Uh, is there any uh, staff or any uh, commission that uh, 
want to make any statements or any any comments? Uh, I, I just wanted to say, uh, I thought it would be a nice idea uh, <clears throat> for us to send a thank you to Jefferson County, uh, Joe Plummer, because we weren't able to secure any uh, hand sanitizer for our office through Quill or Staples. And I was able to reach out and they supplied us with the hand sanitizer for the office. So we probably got enough for a good year. <laughs> uh, you know, it was, it was really nice on their part. And I thought, you know, if we could do a thank you, that maybe came from you and Katie sure. or whoever, you know. Sure. Gwen, if you want to yep. draft up a thank you letter and we can put our signatures on it, that's be great. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I just wanted to add to that the cleanup in Boondall from the fire uh, was completed. Uh, the city yes. of Rome came up and uh, did that. Uh, one of those really hot days, you know, they all, all the workers had those nice complete suits on to protect them and it's kind of leveled off and I think now the property owners are just deciding where to move forward. I think all the businesses located in there have gone somewhere else uh, except for Slim's restaurant. And uh, I, don't, I think that their plan is still up in the air. A lot of the businesses in those buildings didn't own the buildings. So I think the property owners are still figuring out what they're going to do with that. Also, um, Last Friday, I met with uh, one of the field representatives, uh, Carmen O'Keefe from Apex Power, who is working on the large solar project in Forceport and Boonville. Uh, they have cut the project back a little bit. She had uh, a new proposed map on her laptop, but we couldn't see it very well because we were meeting in Irwin Park in Boonville. Uh, however, she did say, uh, that they are going to be using, um, they're not going to be going through art, the Article 10 review. They're going to go with the new regulations that the governor has come out with, which is really going to uh, make the project move much more quickly. They did award a number of community projects, uh, Forceport, Boonville, and Remsen, uh, you know, not really large amounts. Uh, I actually did one for our local food pantry for $5,000 and that was awarded. So, you know, they're, they're trying to uh, integrate themselves into the community. They haven't been around much, but um, they are back in the, in the area now. So it'll be interesting to see how that moves forward. Uh, a couple of things Jerry, is there in park open? Uh, the pool is not open. Uh, certain parts of it are open. Like you, there's a lot of hiking and walking trails there. Uh, the pavilions, as long as you social distance. Uh, some of the playground stuff had things around it, um, but that was last week. And since then, I think we've moved, moved to phase three. So uh, I know there's no way the pool is going to be open this year. Yeah, I'm just thinking is a, that might be a that might be a candidate also for for our uh, retreat because I I was I went by last Friday and there were people at the pavilions distanced but they they were they were open. Yeah. Yes. So. And one positive thing that did happen, you know, the Boomba Fair was canceled and the Woodsman's was right. canceled, but the Woodsman's uh, group had reached out to some vendors and they had a drive-through vendor weekend for all different kinds of uh, fair food, you know, sausage and peppers and funnel cakes and candy apples. And it was very, very popular. People waited in line over an hour wow. to go through a uh, property owned by the Woodsman's. And they're looking at other ways to uh, make some money, like an outdoor uh, movie. And, but they're going to be doing this again so it's kind of like a you know a good junk food weekend if you <laughs> you got a need for that and you wait in their car and they come over and serve you so that, that's a good idea good. good um jerry on the boomville thing um just as an fyi matt and elena took a look at boomville's zoning laws and 
um, there's a few things I, I can't remember the details about a few things that need might need to be tweaked if mm -hmm. at, if and when they rebuild on the site so we um, I think Matt sent him sent the mayor a letter and copied uh, is Ken St Stab still the um, well no they have hired somebody else you know he retired and then they planning and somebody. zoning Oh, yes, yes. I thought you meant the Municipal Commission. No, he's no, still on the chairman of the planning board, I believe. We sent a letter with, you know, an offer of assistance. Yeah. Um, so just so you know that. And then on the new siting, Accelerator Renewables, there was an article in Tugville Times about they're accepting comments right now on how the community benefit funding should work for that. So it's pointed out, I mean, it might be something, especially since you've got some experience with them and this, I don't know how they ran the little community project awards that they just did for you guys, but maybe there might be something you want to. Yeah, it was, it was like a couple pages, you know, most very easy to do. You didn't have to give much documentation at all. Uh, and there were four different categories, uh, but they are going to do it again in the fall. Nice. So. Hmm. Any other questions or comments? Anybody? Oh. Oh. So, so Jan, let me ask you: When do you when do you yes, expect just, to be flying again? Um, <laughs> uh, it's a good question. I had uh, I had something I had to do last week. Um, we are struggling trying to get the auto industry going again, and I I had to uh, go to uh, believe it or not, Buffalo, West Virginia, where the largest Toyota plant in the country as assembly plant. And uh, I'd uh, get permission from a uh, senior VP to travel. And uh, the rule was that when you come back to your domicile, you've got to uh, sequester for 14 days. I said, I guess that's the message. They don't want me to travel yet. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I just wonder because, so yeah, because my, uh, my daughter traveled from El Paso to Idaho. Uh, my granddaughter's bridal shower was this weekend, and uh, she said the plane mm -hmm. was packed. And I was like, I wanted to go was so bad. Was it really? Wow. Yeah, I wanted to go so bad, but I'm a high risk person. I'm in the high risk category. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, there's. I would have probably had a heart attack if I seen that. But so I just wondered. Yeah, I wonder how it'll be before. Well, it's going, to, it's going to take time. Right now, as I fly Delta exclusively, and, uh, you know, I, I, so basically out of Syracuse, I can go to Detroit. There's five nonstops to Detroit a day. There is uh, three nonstops to Atlanta, uh, of course, New York, and then uh, Minneapolis. And right now, we're limited to one uh, flight to, uh, to uh, Atlanta and one flight to Detroit right now. So there's only two flights leaving uh, leaving Syracuse on Delta right now. So it's going to take some time to get that thing started again. So, so I can always use the excuse. I didn't have a flight. So there you go. Good. If there's no other comments, any questions or queries, then uh, can I have a, a motion to adjourn? You got it. Roger. Second. Second. Good. All those in favor? Tom, you look great, by the way. Oh, thanks, Quinn. Yes, yes. Good to see you, Tom. Yeah. Leona, did you have something you wanted to say? Just Take care, just Lee. I thought, um, in regards to the annual meeting, maybe, maybe we should um, come up with an agenda 